All right. So are we are we good to go, Parvina? We are. Yes. Great. All right. Well, here we are, and uh, welcome everybody. I'm uh, Barry Servet, and I am the medical director for McPap, and uh, it's always my pleasure to uh, kick off our um, and facilitate our clinical conversations program. Um, so uh, just as a reminder, we're always, uh, well, most of the time we're on the fourth Tuesday of every month. Um, the next uh, one is gonna be um, March, sorry, March 26th. Um, and the topic next month is, uh, the in sync instinct uh, promoting resilience in the context of disrupted caregiving. Um, but today's topic is actually the title is between mad, bad, and sad irritability in children's mental health. And uh, I will introduce our wonderful speaker uh, momentarily. Um, but uh, just uh, starting with a little bit of housekeeping. Um, if you're on video, you'll see on the screen that there are instructions for CME credits. And we're, as usual, offering them through uh, Mass General Hospital. Uh, the code is V as in Victor, A, Z as in Zebra, M uh, as in Mary, O, L as in Lake. Um, session will be recorded, as usual, available on the MCPEP website. Uh, the slides will be available on the MCPEP website as well. Uh, we will be really happy and uh, welcoming of questions at any point during the presentation and at the end. Uh, so feel free you know, to use the chat uh, to uh, enter a question um, or even to ask yourself to be unmuted if you want to read it you know, yourself or, or ask it yourself. Um, at the end, there'll be a survey as usual and, and we read them all and we really value your feedback uh, to help um, inform future programming. So I'm gonna go ahead and introduce uh, our speaker who is uh, someone um, who has actually spoken a fair amount for us before, so he should be a familiar voice uh, and face. His name is Dr. Dan Dickstein. Uh, he is a, a child psychiatrist, actually a triple board uh, child psychiatrist is the chief of McLean Hospital's Simchus uh, Division of Child Medicine Psychiatry, and he's a professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. Um, he is a physician scientist uniquely trained and board certified in pediatrics, adult psychiatry, and child psychiatry, as I said, triple border. Um, he is a, a, a very uh, productive uh, researcher and writer. His lab is called the PD Mind program at McLean Hospital. And uh, his focus in his research has been on brain and behavior uh, basis uh, mechanisms behind mental health disorders in children and adolescents. And he has a special interest in the topic today, which is the topic of irritability, uh, but also bipolar disorder and suicide uh, prevention or suicidology. Uh, he's also been interested in non-suicidal self-injury, uh, which we've talked about here before. Uh, and his mission is ultimately to improve how these kinds of problems are diagnosed, treated, and prevented. Uh, his research on children's mental health has been funded by NIMH, uh, but also the American Foundi Foundation for Suicide Prevention, uh, the Brain Behavior Research Foundation, and the Hood Foundation. He's been recognized for his mentorship, his education, of physicians and psychologists, and um, particularly mentoring people pursuing research careers. And he uh, is the recipient of the NIMH Mentor of the Year Award. Um, so we're going to just go ahead and proceed. I'm going to hand off to Dr. Dickstein. Um, and thank you again for being here. Thanks so much for that wonderful introduction and also for inviting me. It's really a pleasure to come and join the McPap group. Uh, which uh, does amazing work to help the mental health of children, adolescents, and families across Massachusetts, and really is a role model program uh, for so many programs across the country. Um, I'm going to talk today about uh, uh, what we know about irritability and what, what we need to know. Um, and uh, as Dr. Servet said, so please ask questions, love questions, and um, have plenty of time for questions. There are 10 take home points throughout this talk. Um, and I promise I'll highlight those as well. So I do 
uh, have been lucky to have research funding um, from the federal government and foundations. I don't have any industry uh, or, or commercial support. Um, so we have three learning objectives. Uh, to start with, to review the importance of irritability in current psychiatric practice from childhood to adulthood, then to discuss prior relevant research, including work about bipolar disorder and the new DSM-5 disruptive mood dysregulation disorder, uh, and third, sort of what we can do now to both diagnose and treat these things while we're also trying to improve these things in the future. So I want to talk about sort of two prototypical children uh, names have been altered uh, to sort of describe how I got interested in this work. These were types of kids that I saw many versions of over the course of my training in both pediatrics and psychiatry, uh, two sort of prototypes that I think about on a daily basis that, that guide my interest clinically in teaching and in research. So Jack, Jack's a five-year-old who has fatigue, fever, joint pain, a swollen belly, and he bruises easily. Someone says, whoa, this is not good. Jack's not right. We need to figure out what's going on. They take him to their primary care provider and see that his liver is big, spleen is big, and Jack's kind of pale. The primary care provider orders a biomarker, and it's nothing fancy. It's something all of us have had. Um, it's a complete blood count. On the complete blood count, which all of us have had, it shows that Jack's white blood cells, the cells that fight infection, are too low, and of those, too many are blast, they're uh, primitive white blood cells. Instantly, clinical suspicion plus a biomarker results in the early quick diagnosis, uh, mechanism-targeted treatment, and a better prognosis and outcome. So Jack has ALL, the most common form of childhood cancer, childhood leukemia, and while that's not good, I would not wish childhood leukemia or cancer on anybody, the reality is that fusion of uh, biomarkers plus clinical care has totally transformed child cancer outcomes and care from the 80s when most kids died, unfortunately. Till now, on the graph on the right, you see the five-year survival of kids with ALL is over 95%, um, showing that when people get together, parents, clinicians, researchers, uh, insurers, um, people who fund research, you can totally transform the care of an illness within under a generation. Um, and cancer is no longer in our top three causes of death of kids. Another prototypical child, Gabby, who at age eight uh, is very moody, can be irritable, angry, and destructive, but other times can be really sad, sullen, and want to die. And yet on the third hand, can be hyper, silly, and goofy. At age four, Gabby was brought to therapy for anger and for not following directions. At age six, Gabby was treated for anxiety with an SSRI in therapy, but after a couple of weeks, she was hospitalized for out of control behavior. It wasn't clear what was the cause, but that's where she went. Um, do we have a biomarker for Gabby to figure out if she has bipolar disorder or another problem? Do we have mechanism guided treatment? Can we figure out if Gabby will live to be age 15, 20, 21, let alone Will she be in the hospital or not? Uh, what about Gabby's realistic real world risk for suicide in one hour, one day, one week? Does Gabby need to go to the ER for an evaluation? Does Gabby need to be inpatient in the hospital or could Gabby do outpatient care? And the reality is um, we don't have, we have lots of information about these things, but we don't have the same level of precision um, for Gabby's care. Um, and so that's really kind of what my work is focused on for the past two decades or so uh, in my PD Mind program or the Pediatric Mood Imaging and Neurodevelopment program. It's the idea of can we identify the brain and behavior mechanisms of child psychiatric disorders to result in more accurate and effective ways to diagnose and treat these things following the model of childhood cancer and not saying in any way, shape or form that these tests right now are ready for prime time or should be uh, the basis of our clinical diagnosis. But that's the goal of, of what my work is about. Um, and so we're going to talk about irritability. Why are we talking about irritability? Uh, and I promise I'm not referencing the current uh, geopolitical climate of the world, but you could think about that too. But we're going to talk about kids' mental health. So irritability is the top chief complaint for outpatient mental health visits for children and adolescents. What you're seeing here on the, and the, this is a binary sense of gender, that may not be au courant, but in this study, um, it shows that in the 80s and the 2000s, both for biological males and biological females, irritable mood is the top complaint of why kids are brought for outpatient visits. Um, it's associated with substantial impairment in adulthood. So it's not necessarily just a phase for many kids that goes away and they'll be fine adults. Um, 
So studies have shown that childhood irritability, a study by String Garris, over 600 children interviewed when they were 13 year old on average and 33 year old on average, show that adolescent irritability predicts increased rates of mental health issues in adulthood, including depression, generalized anxiety disorder, and dysthymia. Interestingly, in this study, it did not predict bipolar disorder, nor did it predict access to personality disorders. It also predicted decreased income and decreased educational attainment. So grown-up kids with irritability were not all right. Another study by Pickles uh, in the Isle of Wight, so a study, a longitudinal study of, of over 2,000 uh, British youth uh, followed through midlife, again, showed adolescent irritability was a significant risk factor for suicidality in adults, increasing that risk by over threefold. Uh, another point, irritability is not specific to any disorder. And so uh, Oscar the Grouch is sort of cute, but irritability is not so cute. Um, it's associated with as an explicit diagnostic criteria for a manic episode in kids or adults. It's a child-specific modification of the major depressive episode criteria. It's part of oppositional defiant disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder. It's an associated feature of ADHD, conduct disorder, uh, intermittent explosive disorder, autism, uh, and it's now encapsulated the new DSM-5, disruptive mood dysregulation disorder, DMDD, which we'll talk about where that diagnosis came from and, and things about that in a second. I would love to hear people's thoughts about that as we have time for questions. So take home point number one of 10, as I promised. Irritability is a big problem. It's the most common reason kids are brought for psychiatric evaluation to the ER in outpatient settings. It's an explicit diagnostic criteria or an associated symptom for multiple different disorders. It's associated with significant impairment in adulthood, including academic and employment problems, poverty, psychiatric problems, and suicide. There is no biomarker or scale that specifically guides clinicians in determining what disorder or disorder is a child with irritability does or does not have. Uh, several articles have highlighted the need for better treatments for irritability. And what's the result of our lack of biological mechanism-oriented precision? Well, potentially the over or misdiagnosis of these conditions. Uh, the lack of mechanism-oriented uh, approaches may be involved with why more and more kids are being diagnosed with ADHD or hospitalized for bipolar disorder or autism. Again, that should actually be one in, I think, 34 children is the latest rate. It's sort of hard to keep these slides updated. Um, I've been a trainee or, uh, or faculty for these different waves of, of, of diagnostic increase from uh, ADHD happened before I was a medical student. Bipolar disorder is how I got into research as a resident and autism as faculty. Um, lots of kids are struggling with these things. I just think the Gabbies of the world deserve what the Jacks of the world have. Um, so I would say irritability is not just the most important mental health problem because it's more than mental health. It's also economics and it's more than just a child problem because it extends to adulthood. I would actually argue irritability is actually potentially the most important health problem we face. So our second learning objective to discuss prior relevant research, including work on bipolar disorder and disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. So take home point number two. Much research on irritability comes from work on bipolar disorder. And so when I was a trainee finishing training in the early 2000s, these were the questions that people were actively dogmatically fighting about. Is bipolar disorder an episodic disorder with a distinct onset and offset distinguishable from baseline euthymic or normal mood? Or is it a chronic disorder characterized by rapid alteration, mixed episodes, or lots of just primarily irritability? That was one big debate. Another big debate was, is bipolar disorder in kids? Maybe it's it's just about irritability, or can kids actually experience elevated expansive mood, otherwise known as euphoria? And so there are a lot of different approaches to this, but one of the approaches that I learned about and got involved about was that of Dr. Ellen Liebenloft, who uh, was at the National Institute of Mental Health in Washington, DC. And she basically said, well, if we're concerned about episodes or not, and if we're concerned about, concerned about euphoria or not, you could make this into a two by two table and you could test it out. And what Dr. Liebenloft and then I and others were involved with and continue to be involved with are looking at sort of the extremes. On the one hand, narrow phenotype bipolar disorder. Narrow meaning a strict interpretation of the criteria. These are kids who have full duration manic or hypomanic episodes that include euphoria. They could also involve irritability, but they had to involve euphoria. Just irritability alone 
would not get the diagnosis of narrow phenotype bipolar disorder. At the other extreme was a set of criteria called severe mood dys dysregulation or SMD. This was the idea of chronic non-episodic irritability. These kids could not have clear episodes. They could not have euphoria. And so the questions were, uh, and these were based on a series of National Institute of Mental Health sponsored roundtables that then Dr. Liebenhoff kind of took the ball and ran with uh, on a lot of productive research. And the question is, do these two different types of kids exist, yes or no? If they exist, what do they look like over time? Do their symptoms stay true to course? Uh, or do people with chronic irritability end up becoming people with euphoric mania? What about their brain and behavior mechanisms? And this was the research that I got involved with uh, after I finished training and, and continue to be involved with. Um, this is not the only approach to advance what we know about irritability, but this is sort of how I got involved and how I continue to be involved. So sharing some of the work that Dr. Liebenloff stimulated, some of mine and some of colleagues. So this study by Dr. Brokman and colleagues looked at, uh, used the Great Smoky Mountain study, a longitudinal sample uh, in North Carolina, uh, kids followed over time to say, if you look at kids with chronic irritability, are there such kids? And what they found was that the lifetime prevalence of these severe mood dysregulation, chronic irritability criteria was about 3.3% of about 1,400 kids aged 9 to 19. It was most commonly associated with ADHD conduct disorder and oppositional defiant disorder. In wave one, when they're age 10, uh, if you follow them, they are more likely to have depression at wave two, again, age 18, versus youth who never met SMD, suggesting that chronic irritability might be more associated with unipolar major depression than with mania or bipolar disorder. There's another study, uh, different sample, uh, the Children in the Community study from upstate New York, over 776 youth assessed at time one, again, mid-teens, uh, early teens, 13, to time two, 16, to time three, age 22. What they found were there were different associations with what irritability looked like. So kids with chronic irritability at time one, when kids were about 13, predicted ADHD at time two when they were 16, and major depressive disorder when they were 22 at time three. Whereas episodes, episodes of euphoria predicted uh, simple phobia, and then ultimately mania at time two, suggesting that episodes matter when it comes to irritability versus a chronic course. So that's some of the longitudinal information. Um, what about brain behavior mechanisms? And this, uh, try to make this not so jarring for a middle day conversation, but there are a lot of different ways you can literally get into the minds of kids struggling with emotional issues, including irritability. So you could look at emotional face recognition. If, if the face is our most basic way of understanding emotions and conveying emotions, understanding how people can or can't recognize other people's facial emotions is one way to get into the emotional functioning beyond just questionnaires. Another thing you can do is look at response inhibition, uh, very relevant to conditions of ADHD and related things like that. So can people stop themselves from responding in certain situations? Again, given the overlap between ADHD and mania, this has been a productive area of research. Um, most of my research has been in this third domain called frustrative non-reward. I know that's a lot of jargon for the middle of the day, but um, it's defined as the response to blocked goal attainment. So, uh, for example, um, you're trying to get a cookie, but you can't get into the jar, or you are trying to get somewhere in traffic, but you're stuck. So you want the reward, you want to reach the goal, you can't get the reward, and then your reaction may be frustrated when that goal attainment is blocked. You can test this in many ways. Um, so one way you can test it is by using accurate and rigged feedback um, on certain games, which uh, we may talk about. Another way is cognitive flexibility. So can people behaviorally adapt to change in rewards and punishments? I know this sounds jargony, but I think we're gonna get this into sort of more, more common sense, understandable framework in a sec. So I got very interested in cognitive flexibility. Again, the idea of behavioral change in response to reward and punishment. You all understand that. So for the sake of maybe getting some CME or getting together or learning about something, you came to today's talk, you adapted your behavior, hopefully in the response for reward. You all demonstrated extremely wonderful cognitive flexibility, whereas other people might have said, hey, I'm too busy or I can't do this or things like that. Turns out that cognitive flexibility, um, again, objectively uh, can be assessed 
uh, using imaging, and the symptoms of cognitive flexibility may be echoed in the symptoms of mania and depression. So for example, mania, a hyperhedonic increased reward period as evidenced by people who are manic have elevated expansive euphoric mood. They feel not just good, but super good, even though life around them is not so great. They may be engaged in increased goal-directed activity, um, uh, building, uh, planning, et cetera, without actually achieving those goals. They may be involved with excess pleasurable activities with high potential for painful consequences. And most people who are manic, they don't care about the consequences. They're just going on the spending sprees or the sex sprees or, or doing what they want. On the other hand, depression may be a hypohedonic, a decreased reward sensitivity period as evidenced by depressed mood and hedonia, meaning no pleasure and feelings of worthlessness and guilt. Um, so again, reward changes may be linked to symptoms of mania and depression. And the brain area is responsible for cognitive flexibility. This adaptation response to reward and punishment um, includes your dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. That's around where my hairline is, more or less. Um, that has a lot to do with attention, executive function, and planning. Uh, your striatum, which I can't show you because it's in the middle of my head, which has a lot to do with uh, reward, including addictive substances. And the amygdala, and while everyone will say, oh, the amygdala is involved with everything, the amygdala actually, interestingly enough, um, has an interesting role in helping people learn by trial and error. Um, and so these three areas had been suggested in studies of adults with bipolar disorder that maybe they might be going on. And in my early years of research, we were starting to figure out, are these things involved with kids with narrow phenotype bipolar disorder? And I'm gonna share with you some of that work um, because I said, this is more objective. This is more like the jacks of the world. So how do you test cognitive flexibility in a kid uh, objectively? So it's not about questionnaires, not about interviews. Um, video games are one way in. So this is something called the Cambridge Neuropsychological Automated Testing Battery or the CAMTAB. Um, this is a touchscreen version of many standard neuropsychological tasks. And this particular one is like the Wisconsin card sorting task, maybe from back in psych undergrad classes. But basically, real simple, you put a kid in front of this, you say, do your best. On the left side, that's their initial screen. They quickly learn through trial and error. If they press the thing that looks like a tree, it goes ant. Eh. If they press the thing that looks like a clam, it goes ding. And of course, everybody wants more ding than ant. Eh. And so they very quickly adapt their behavior to just press the thing that looks like a clam. All of a sudden, without warning, it reverses. The thing that was previously rewarded, the clam, is now punished. The thing that was previously punished, the tree, is now rewarded. How fast you adapt from the previously rewarded thing to the new reversed rewarded thing, that's cognitive flexibility. You can look at how many errors it, you make before you reverse. You can look at how many trials it takes you to adapt, how much time it takes you to adapt. And in a series of studies, we show that kids with narrow phenotype bipolar disorder, um, they didn't have, everybody thought they'd have tons of neuropsychological deficits. They actually didn't. This was one of the few things that narrow phenotype bipolar kids had. They made more errors. It took them more trials to adapt compared to healthy controls. Um, if you compare them to kids with severe mood dysregulation, the kids with chronic irritability, the kids with narrow phenotype bipolar disorder still had these reversal learning deficits on this task. You say, wait a second, I don't always get pulled over by the statey for speeding, and I don't always get praised by my spouse or my parent for doing the right thing. You can add probabilistic feedback. So instead of something being all right or all wrong, it may be mostly right, but sometimes wrong are mostly wrong and sometimes right. It makes the task a lot more difficult to understand the patterns, like in real life. And so even with this probabilistic task, the narrow phenotype bipolar kids had reversal learning deficits compared to controls. And in a five group study comparing narrow phenotype bipolar kids, severe mood dysregulation kids with chronic irritability, anxious kids, depressed kids and controls, it was really the narrow phenotype bipolar kids who had this deficit suggesting that this might be specific to kids with narrow phenotype bipolar disorder with episodes of euphoria. Um, I promised you brain stuff. So before we started this work, there were some studies with adults and kids. Um, the adult studies said maybe there were changes in these frontal areas, but it was sort of inconsistent. There were two studies at the time, long time ago, now there are many more, about uh, amygdala volume showing that 
amygdala volume was smaller, but we wanted to look across the whole brain. And we actually conduct, conducted the first study across the whole brain volume of narrow phenotype bipolar kids, showing that the three areas implicated in cognitive flexibility, again, your left dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, your amygdala, and your accumbens area, all three of these areas were smaller in narrow phenotype bipolar kids compared to healthy controls. So we've shown behavioral deficits on reversal learning related to cognitive flexibility on two different tasks in narrow phenotype bipolar kids. We've shown decreased volume in those brain areas responsible for cognitive flexibility. But what you all want to see, what we want to see was what's going on in the mind of the kids when they're actually doing these tasks. And for that, you can use functional magnetic resonance imaging to see what's going on in terms of brain activity when people are doing stuff. Um, this is a picture of me in front of the MRI, just to show you the basic parts of how we do this. So kids lay on the bed, uh, their feet go up on the pillow, their head goes in the helmet. The part of the head, uh, kid's head in this case, is being played by, oops, whoa, that wasn't me, by a milk jug. Um, so the kid lies their head in the helmet. On top of the helmet is a mirror so that when they look up, they can see behind the big MRI magnetic donut. And they're in there up to about their knees for about an hour or so, and they can't move more than three millimeters. And if you've ever had an MRI, you're like, whoa, that is really hard. Um, but we use our child psychiatry and psychology skills to make kids feel very comfortable. Um, and kids are actually able to do this with, uh, you know, actually they really enjoy it because they get to see their brain pictures and they have a lot of fun. And in our PD Mind program, we're always looking for kids who might want to join us in studies, uh, both to help us advance our understanding of the mechanisms of irritability, suicide, self-injury. We definitely also need healthy control kids um, who don't have mental health issues. That's actually our biggest challenge right now. Um, and we definitely appreciate some help because the faster we get the number of kids, the faster we can help the Gabbies of the world. Um, but kids actually have fun in the MRI, believe it or not. Um, so we did a study, the first ever study, looking at the brain activity in kids with narrow phenotype bipolar disorder. Uh, during these tasks. They're playing the game, the reverse learning game in the scanner, and we're measuring brain activity. And what you're seeing on the left are the pretty pictures showing that in your dorsal frontal cortex, the area I talked about, and several other areas, the reward areas of the caudate, the brain activity is different in healthy kids versus controls. On the right, the graph is showing the reddish color are healthy controls. When they're acquiring the stimulus word association, the initial pairing, their brain activity goes up, they're learning. When it gets reversed, so what was reward is now punished, what was punished is now rewarded, their brain activity goes down because this is actually not that hard of a task. On the other hand, for bipolar kids, it's the exact opposite. Um, when they hit that reversal, their brain activity goes way up in all these regions, like they are somehow surprised or shocked. Now, they don't quit. Uh, they don't give up, they don't jump out of our scanner, but it takes them more activity to maintain their performance on this task than healthy kids, uh, the exact opposite pattern. And if you look at kids with severe mood dysregulation in a separate study now added in green, their brain activity is completely different than the narrow phenotype bipolar kids. And lest you think that this is sort of esoteric neuroscience or irrelevant, essentially this may show the neural basis why standard behavior modification is not necessarily that effective in bipolar kids because their brains are not necessarily wired to adapt to changing rewards and punishments. Similarly, standard cognitive behavioral therapy, there are a couple studies of that. Standard cognitive behavioral therapy without adaptations is not so effective in kids with bipolar disorder, potentially because their brains are wired differently than other types of kids. They're, you know, the reward basis to adapt, which is required to understand CBT principles of understanding the relationship between your thoughts, behaviors, and outcomes is different in the bipolar kids. So this neuroscience in some ways does give us a sense of why some therapies don't work and may have some windows of opportunity for how to design potentially new therapies. So take on point number three, episodes matter. Bipolar use has specific neural alterations and longitudinal courses uh, compared to kids with chronic irritability. So there are other studies. Again, this is not the only way to look at it. Another uh, series of studies, the course and outcome of bipolar youth, a Kobe study, was a Brown Pittsburgh UCLA study that I was a consultant on. Um, they instead of looking at chronic irritability versus episodic euphoria, they used to use DSM criteria to enroll bipolar one, two, and bipolar not otherwise specified kids. They had to have criteria for not otherwise specified if you're doing a three site study. And basically they said, instead of the full 
uh, number of symptoms uh, in terms of euphoria or irritability, they just dropped them by one. So you had to have instead of uh, three DSM symptoms if you're euphoric and four if you're irritable, for Kobe bipolar or not otherwise specified, you had two if euphoric and three if irritable. You had to have a clear change in functioning. The symptoms had to be present a significant part of the day, um, and you had to have four days lifetime of that. So, so some symptoms of bipolar disorder quantified in a way that you could do with a multi-site study. And what we did a collaboration with a COBE study, looking at, again, that CANTAB task, showing that the kids with clear-cut bipolar one or bipolar two, they're the ones who also had this reversal learning deficit compared to the kids with bipolar disorder not otherwise specified and compared to healthy controls. So in an independent sample, we replicated the idea that episodes of bipolar disorder matter in terms of cognitive flexibility. We did another study in my group looking at the Kobe kids grown up. So we restudied them with the CANTAB when they were 18 to 25, showing that actually it's not just a phase. It doesn't get better when those bipolar kids become bipolar adults. Even bipolar adults still have the impairments in reversal learning um, as adults. So all this stuff, hard to believe, is like 11 years ago, but DSM-5 is supposed to fix all of these problems with bipolar disorder and other disorders. And changes were made based on data, both that we provided and other people provided. Um, I should say, again, the goal of Dr. Liebenlove's work and my work was not to add a new diagnosis. The goal of our work was to test out the dogma about episodes versus chronic and euphoria versus irritability. But DSM pulls in lots of science. They have expert committees. They evaluate the evidence. And they made changes from DSM-4 to DSM-5. So one of the things they changed based on data in terms of mania was to add uh, the not just a mood change, elevated expansive or irritable mood, but they also add the idea that it had to be present most of the day, nearly every day. Those words verbatim were copied from the criteria for a major depressive episode. They were meant to help make it more specific about what does a manic or a hypomanic episode look like. They also were much clearer about saying you can't just have B symptoms of grandiosity or decreased need for self asleep for sleep or pressured speech. B criteria alone don't make mania or hypomania. You have to have the criteria A, a mood change, plus the B criteria. And then lastly, they added the fact that during the mood change, you had to have at least increased goal or activity or energy during that. So they added some specific B symptoms to that, uh, with the idea being essentially they want to tighten up based on data, the criteria for bipolar one and bipolar two for mania and hypomania. They added new diagnosis. Again, this was not the goal of our research, but they did add a new diagnosis called disruptive mood dysregulation disorder or DMDD. A couple things to note if you haven't looked at these criteria. I hope you will take a look at them because um, they are interesting. They were meant to be in some ways the most specific diagnosis. Um, so they operationalized what does irritability mean? So the idea of recurrent temper outburst manifested verbally or behaviorally with physical aggression grossly out of proportion and intensity to or duration of the situation. The temper outbursts are inconsistent with developmental level. They operationalize chronic, so it had to occur at least three times per week. The mood between outbursts had to be persistently irritable and angry, uh, present most of the day, nearly every day, observable to others, so not just based on self-report. And you couldn't have more than three consecutive months without those symptoms. So if the kid was fine in summer, they should not have this diagnosis. It had to be present in at least two settings and severe in at least one. Um, also, um, if they had even one day of mania or hypomania, one day of euphoria or pressured speech, et cetera, then they should not have this diagnosis. And lastly, if this, all the stuff, A through J, A through I, is only during depression, or better explained by autism, PTSD, separation anxiety disorder, dysthymia, persistent depressive disorder, then they should not get the diagnosis of DMDD. So lots of very specific stuff here. Um, so it's not supposed to be the new mood disorder NOS. It's not supposed to be, hey, that kid's irritable. It's meant to be a very specific diagnosis applied to a very small subset of kids. 
So take home point number four, DMDD is meant to be the most precise diagnosis, not a new NOS of mood NOS or bipolar NOS or hey, that kid's got irritability. Take home point number five, if they have a known cause for irritability, depression, ADHD, autism, it's not DMDD. And there are lots of ways to sort of think about these things. But again, so these kids, it's not to say these other kids don't have irritability. ODD involves irritability. Autism can involve irritability. Intermittent explosive disorder can involve irritability. But it's different than kids with DMDD. So third learning objective, and hopefully we're having plenty of time for questions. So how do we diagnose and treat disorders involving irritability now? And what can we do in the future? So now it's to me, it's all about sort of being careful in your assessment. So uh, as a pediatrician, I learned the PQRST is a pain assessment, which I think are useful for mental health too. So what are the precipitants? What's the triggers, the context, the setting? What's the quality of the symptoms? Are there episodes or is it chronic? What about the quantity? How long does it last? Um, can you quantify the impairment? Is it relieved by anything? How does irritability, et cetera, end? What about associated symptoms of psychosis, ADHD, anxiety, substance use? And then T, what's the time course? Um, take home point number six, diagnose the process, not a destination. By that, I mean you want to apply the best working hypothesis diagnosis you have based on the evidence. But as you hopefully get the opportunity to work with a kid or a family, your diagnosis may evolve and should evolve. So if when you see them, you really have evidence that they have bipolar one and mania, you should say that, you shouldn't hold back on that. On the other hand, if you don't have full evidence of bipolar disorder type one or, or DMDD or, or any diagnosis, quite honestly, you should say, what do you have best evidence for currently? Uh, and then what are you concerned about in letting it evolve? Um, examples are good to get beyond jargon lately. A uh, couple seconds of, of video on a phone, et cetera, helps me get beyond the jargon of a parent to see what we're really worried about. Again, these are principles that are generic to all of child mental health. They're not necessarily specific to irritability. Take home point number seven. So mood tracking can help you really understand the time course of a kid's illness. So on the left is something called the BEAM mood chart, totally free, feel free to Google it. Um, B is for bipolar, M is for mood, and I can't tell you what ENA stand for. Um, on the right is a free app called eMoods, which I have no commercial ties to. You're basically asking every day a parent and maybe even a kid to chart four things. So on the beam mood chart in the rainbow bar, you put one check mark on the colored column representative of their major mood. So normal, mild, moderate, severely elevated, meaning too happy, or mild, moderately, severely depressed. Use the column for the, the date. So today's the 27th, you would put a check mark in the rainbow on the 27th for the kid's predominant mood that day. You would rate anxiety, zero is none to three is severe. You'd rate irritability, zero is none, three is severe. And you'd rate your best guesstimate of sleep. You don't have to do this for forever, but a week of mood tracking, both week, some weekdays and some weekends, often allows me to really understand the nature of a kid's mental health challenges. Um, on the right, uh, electronic version of this, that you're doing the same basic thing. What's cool about eMoods is it, it can graph it and they can email you the graphs, which is neat. Um, if you do use the paper chart, one extra little bonus pearl for those who are listening, if they bring you the piece of paper and everything's in the same color, the same mark with the same pen, they did that in the parking lot before they got to you because nobody carries around the same pen for a week uh, and makes the same type of mark. Um, so rating scales are helpful to quantify symptoms, but they don't specifically diagnose bipolar disorder or irritability or anything. So like the child behavior checklist, uh, which for a while was talked about as a juvenile bipolar profile, the reality is lots of those studies show it doesn't predict bipolar disorder with any specificity. Um, it does predict emotion dysregulation. Again, that's the combination of the T-scores of attention, aggression, and anxiety and depression. So. I think the CVCL is useful to understand those subscales, um, but it doesn't necessarily give perfect mapping to, to DSM-5 stuff. Um, the Young Mania Rating Scale is great for quantifying symptoms of mania, uh, as is the Children's Depression Rating Scale for symptoms of depression. Um, there are some early studies of the Parent Reported General Behavior Inventory, or the PGBI-10, looking at it might have some specificity when used uh, to look at mania and bipolar disorder, but again, it, it still needs more replication because other more recent studies have shown that it doesn't quite work. 
Um, people also use the affective reactivity index as a way of quantifying irritability, but the RE, the affective reactivity index, is basically questions drawn from the criteria for oppositional defiant disorder. So again, not really specific to something. Take home point number eight in terms of treatment. So from my perspective, treating medications to treat what you see is important. So if you think about do they have irritability, if the answer is yes, then really your question is, what is the irritability come with a side of? If, does it come with a side of depression or anxiety, in which case you might use cognitive behavioral therapy and an SSRI? Does it come with autism, in which case you might do a functional analysis of behavior to try to help parents and caregivers? And you might use the FDA approved atypicals to treat irritability. Does it come with ADHD, in which case, again, there's a role for work with the parents and the kids and educators. There's also a role for stimulants. Does it come with ODD, in which case there's a role for family therapy and parenting intervention? So if they have irritability, thinking about what's on the side will oftentimes guide your evidence-based medication treatment. Um, and this is data from a recent study showing that irritability actually does decrease in the multimodal treatment of ADHD study, an oldie but a goodie, showing that uh, the right treatments uh, in terms of combination uh, of medication and behavior can really result in improved irritability. Another important study, this is an interesting meta-analysis looking at, uh, by Stuckelman, very useful study um, showing that there's a greater risk of irritability in general with amphetamine derivatives compared to methylphenidate derivatives. So if you have a kid with lots of irritability and they have ADHD, you may want to think through which types of stimulants either are they on or maybe should they be on. Um, take home point number nine, therapies, treat what you see. Um, so everybody probably could use some psychoeducation to understand what symptoms you're putting into diagnostic categories and how do you uh, help people be aware of those symptoms so that you can prevent some of the exacerbations. Um, interpersonal social rhythm therapy drawn on work from adults with bipolar disorder, but really pretty helpful to lots of folks. So the idea is you're going to reduce interpersonal stress and you're going to try to increase regular sleep, exercise, and socialization. Again, I think even if you don't have mental health issues, regular sleep, exercise, and socialization is a way to reduce stress and boost wellness. Um, for ADHD, so lots of useful treatments for ADHD, including creative problem solving, uh, parent-child interaction training, and parent management training. For depression, uh, you know, CBT can certainly be helpful, um, shown in many studies. Um, DBT, uh, interestingly shown helpful for depression and some recent studies showing it may be helpful in kids with bipolar disorder. Um, Mick Lewis has a whole line of research on family-focused psychoeducational therapy that combines modifications of cognitive behavioral therapy, psychoeducation, and family treatment uh, really effective at, uh, at helping kids with bipolar disorder. So again, if that's something you haven't heard about, please feel free to check it out because it's really pretty interesting. I think it's one of our least known but most effective treatments, again, for people with bipolar disorder, for kids specifically with bipolar disorder. I promised you 10 take home points and here we are. So there are lots of opportunities and need for people to get involved with work to advance what we know about irritability. Even if you're not, you don't have grant funded research, even if you don't consider yourself a researcher, uh, there are lots of conferences and presentations at workshops and journal publishing opportunities to learn more about irritability because we need everybody pitching together just like they did for the Jacks of the world so that the Gabbies of the world have that improvement. In particular, while lots is known about narrow phenotypes of episodes of euphoria and lots are known about chronic irritability, we're missing the quadrants about episodic irritability or sustained euphoria. We're missing understanding about the associations, patterns, and specificity of irritability with ADHD, autism, anxiety, unipolar, major depression, even maybe you know personality traits, um, and understanding those mechanisms and testing novel treatments. Um, that's sort of what we're doing in the PD Mind program, where we're following the example of childhood leukemia, better understanding of the mechanisms in partnership with our program and Massachusetts and lots of areas and agencies to lead a precision medicine approach, targeted ways to diagnose and treat bipolar disorder, irritability, suicide, self injury. Um, that's the goal. We're not there now, but that's where we sort of need people's help because, again, we want the Gabbies of the world to have the benefits of the Jacks of the world. Some of the things we're doing are looking at kids with irritability across the range of impairment, uh, not based on diagnosis, uh, to understand across the range of irritability, across the range of disorders, what are the mechanisms. So in conclusion, 
Irritability is a big problem, common, nonspecific, and bad. While irritability comes in many flavors, much of the research of the past decades comes from what we know about bipolar disorder. Episodes matter, worth asking about, do they have four to seven days or seven or more days of those symptoms? This includes DMDD, which is not meant to be the catch-all replacement for mood disorder NOS or, hey, that kid's got irritability. If they have a known cause for irritability, like depression, ADHD, or autism, it's not DMDD. Number six, let your diagnosis evolve as you work with the kid. Seven, mood tracking is very helpful to determine the time course, including episodes or chronic triggers, context, and associated symptoms of irritability. Number eight, use medications to treat what you see, including ADHD, depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder. Um, number nine, several psychotherapies might be useful and can be implemented in different ways in different practice settings. And number 10, lots of opportunity and need for everybody to pitch in so we can advance what's known about irritability so our kids can have a brighter future than even today. With that, I want to conclude. I really appreciate the support from funders who are helping us with this work. I appreciate providers who have referred people to our studies because the faster we finish our studies, the faster we can use these data to get it out to the world to improve how we diagnose and treat these things. And thank you, McPat, for the fact that you care about this kind of research and for all you're doing to help the mental health and well being of the kids across Massachusetts. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Dickstein. Um, that was a really great, great talk. And I actually really loved how you uh, really took a dive into the science um, and explained it in a way that is very clearly understandable to clinical folks. And, um, and then you got really practical, you know, about treatment. So, so I, I actually don't see any questions in the chat yet. Um, but I know that anyone who is in primary care or seeing children in clinical settings has irritable patients. And, um, and so, so we'd love to have some questions, you know, even if you wanted to share, you know, a case or a little vignette of, of something that you're struggling with clinically uh, without any PHI, of course, um, or just general questions about the material. So let's uh, take a pause and see if we can have any questions from the audience because we do have you know another ten minutes or so to uh, to pick pick Dr. Dickstein's brain a little bit. <laughs> uh, yes, you will get a copy of these slides. Actually, it's going to be on the website, so they'll be uploaded to the website. That was a question, which I appreciate because I know we went through a lot of stuff, and I tend to talk a little bit fast. Um, but so definitely slides are there. And if people have questions afterwards, I think you have you'll be displaying my contact information. I'm always happy to answer questions. Uh, we're partners in this work. Um, you know, we all need to work together again following the model of childhood cancer. I also don't know if, you know, in the audience, I mean, if people have pearls of wisdom they want to share, I mean, I would love to learn from people in the audience about, you know, what are their approaches to irritability? Um, you know, what do they what do they find most helpful when they're seeing kids who are struggling? Um, because again, um, we're all just trying to learn and to improve these things. So I don't know if anybody has something they want to share about what they do with irritable kids or um, either as a subset of them or just in general. Yeah, that's a really good good prompt as well. Um, I know for me, I mean, it was about a year ago. I, it was interesting. So I, I do this work for research, but I also see it clinically. In a three-week period, I had three families call, say, Dr. Dickstein, we have a super irritable eight-year-old. You got to help us. You got to help us. We don't know what's going on. And I said, okay, come on in. Luckily, I had some vacancies. They came in. And what was fascinating to me, um, and I think to, to our research team who are focused on research, they don't do clinical work, each of these kids with the same basic complaint, the same age group, the same concerned parents had a different issue. And uh, basically one of the kids very clearly was on the autism spectrum. One of the kids was very clearly struggling with OCD and generalized anxiety disorder. And one of the kids had really bad ADHD. But if you would just lump them and said, oh, it's an irritable kid for irritable kids, I only do this, then um, then those kids might not have gotten what they need. So that approach, that Stringaris article about if they have irritability, kind of thinking about what, what are the main silos they have, I do find useful on, on a clinical construct. 
I don't know about you, Dr. Sarbet, if, if I don't know if you see irritable yeah. kids or what, what's your main go-to when you think about irritable kids? Well, that's a great point. Um, you know, just about the, the heterogeneity of irritability um, and that it really is necessary to try to unpack that, you know, sort of to try to figure out, you know, what the context is. And, and you know, I think a lot of people, I, I actually find a lot of my work, um, I think I agree with you in terms of, of focusing on the issue of cognitive inflexibility, uh, just because that uh, seems to be very prevalent just in my patient population. Uh, I treat a lot of kids, you know, who are on the spectrum, you know, as they say, mm -hmm. and that's kind of a major character characterization of, of, of what leads them to be, you know, explosive. Um, it's not the only thing, you know, but, but, uh, but, but I, I do think that that's really important sometimes, you know, it's the, the passions, you know, <laughs> of these kids are, are, are so strong that they can't, you know, contain them. Sometimes it has to do with really a deficit in being able to cope, you know, so, so we, we sort of the vernacular, you know, term of, of coping skills, you know, mm -hmm. really is, is very apt, you know, for these 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 kids, and and in general for for human beings, because, you know, we have to use different parts of our our mental apparatus, you know, in our bodies too, you know, in terms of coping with stress and with perturbations, you know, that occur in the environment and frustrations and you know things not being you know the way that you expect them to be and the way that you want them to be, and so. So, so if you focus on cognitive flexibility, that's kind of a little bit more of a cognitive, you know, approach. Um, and uh, but but there's there's also the the regulation of of emotions, you know, which kind of brings in the body, you know, as well. Yeah. And uh, I think in a major way, and so so that's where you get into, you know, some of the sensory work, you know, and some of the the work, you know, that kids can do to learn how to release, you know, sort of that, that frustration, that tension and to, to really emote. Um, and so, so I think that all these different approaches are, you know, kind of embodied, I think, in some of the psychotherapy models that you listed. Um, but, uh, you know, they're different for different kids, for sure. And I will say a lot, sometimes when I talk about this a lot, that, that's usually the question that comes up. You know, Dr. Dixon, you talked about the bipolar kids and the, their brain behavior deficits and cognitive flexibility. What about kids on the spectrum? Um, what about them? And it's interesting. So that's one of, I would say, on the one hand, the more under-researched areas about from a brain and behavior perspective, uh, we don't know enough about uh, potential alterations in adaptation to reward and punishment in kids on the spectrum. Um, the studies that exist are much less uh, clear in terms of a, you know, hey, this is, this seems like a, a story there. In some ways, I think that's because while every mental health disorder, you know, there, there's heterogeneity, um, I think there's more heterogeneity potentially in autism spectrum disorder, in, essentially in some ways because uh, the criteria have gotten a little bit more broad um, and so in some ways, um, the broadening in some ways makes some of the heterogeneity broader. And also in general, in terms of brain imaging findings uh, about autism, um, there certainly are lots of studies of brain imaging. There are lots of findings. They tend to be less focal on a couple of regions. Um, you know, findings have been found in every lobe, including the cerebellum, um, in, in multiple regions. Um, and so I think that that just may be how the disorder is different, but it is something that people are looking at. But I think it's something that, um, you know, from a symptom perspective, makes a lot of sense that we should be looking more at that. What do you think about um, anxiety? You know, I, I think, uh, you know, we all know, you know, that people who have a high levels of, of anxiety, you know, tend to be, you know, grouchy and irritable and difficult, you know, challenging. We certainly see that with adults. I think mm -hmm. we see that with children, you know, as well. Um, but I, I do think that, you know, in addition to mood, you know, and and the cognitive inflexibility and, you know, and bipolarity and things like that, that that's kind of a big, for me, I see that a lot, you know, in terms of a big sector, you know, of, of patients, you know, of, of factors that really are kind of leading to irritable, you know, behavior. 
Um, do you do you see that as well? So I definitely do clinically, and I think it's also in terms. So in terms of research, we had that one five group study with the probabilistic reversal learning task showing that, uh, which was the bipolar kids, the severe mood dysregulation, chronic irritability kids, kids with generalized anxiety, kids with depression, healthy controls. It was still primarily the kids with clear-cut bipolar disorder who had those impairments in that multiple group study. But I do think that is an area that both by clinical intuition, we should be looking at more um, in terms of cognitive flexibility deficits. I also think, as you've said, it's oftentimes like, so like the irritability oftentimes is there when the kid is is mostly worried, right? So you can have a kid who, if they're, in, you know, uh, if they're at home, they're getting what their needs are met, they're not having triggers of anxiety, like being in front of their class or having to be in a strange situation. Uh, they may not be irritable, but they don't have to adapt. They're getting what they're needed. It's, it's sometimes only in that context when that anxiety trigger is present that they may have a hard time adapting. And so in some ways you could say like that's in many ways the basis of like exposure therapy, right? So to put them in that situation where normally it would be hard for them to adapt, it would kick their anxiety way up. And the more they can tolerate that, the more they're, you know, to adapt to tolerate that, the, the less their anxiety tends to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, As opposed to the reverse, the more, the more the parent accommodates them or they just sort of try to avoid the blow ups, uh, it just reinforces the lack of adaptation. Yeah, from a neurobiological perspective, um, you know, would you say that, I mean, you, you, you've you talked a lot about about frustration um, and uh, that often you know, leads to irritability and, and, and do, you, do you consider frustration, the emotion of frustration to have any correlates, you know, or, or, or similarities to, you know, the, the neurobiological kind of um, phenomena of, of anxiety, um, like when someone's feeling very anxious versus someone who's frustrated. Um, and I wonder about that just because, you know, there also is this linguistic, you know, sort of clue yep. you know, that people sometimes confuse that term. They might say, I'm, I'm anxious you know about something when it's really that they're frustrated about something, and so 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 the the words are kind of used um, kind of as synonyms oftentimes when we think of them very differently, you know, as psychiatrists. And uh, I'm curious what your thoughts are about that. So I think that I mean, ter you know, terminology is important, and uh, definitions of those terms are important and kind of complicated to unpack. So for me. I think a lot about frustration, irritability, and anger um, as sort of the triad to try to unpack. So in some ways, uh, frustration is the situation where someone can't get the reward. So I can't get here from there. I, no matter how hard I work, I can't get the A. No matter how hard I work, I can't lose the weight. No matter how hard I work, I can't get someone to praise me. That may result for some people in frustration. Um, that, the, you know, uh, the mood the person has is sort of the irritability, that, that's their mood. And in some ways, the behavior you see is potentially the anger or the effects of that. Um, and so those are the things that I sort of, we try to unpack. You know, in our studies, as I said, we talk today about a lot of cognitive flexibility, the adaptation stuff. In our ongoing studies where we're still sort of looking for kids, we have studies where we we do use some of those rigged feedback tasks to get a sense of, um, you know, for some kids, those tasks where they may be told that they're not doing well. Some kids, they don't care. They realize this is just a game and, you know, uh, I'm going for pizza after this. And some kids, it's interesting, the little thing will really sort of set them off. So understanding kind of frustration threshold, why that differs in kids with and without certain mental health challenges is a big focus because it's, you can't really generalize that uh, for most kids, but in some ways, if we knew more about that, understanding frustration, tolerance versus intolerance, that would lead to, I think, more precision for kind of what we do. Mm -hmm. but I agree, anxiety, autism uh, are definitely opportunities where we, we need to learn more about these mechanisms um, as a way to help kids. Yeah, and they're very uh, entangled you know, with, with each other oftentimes as well, at least clinically. Yeah. Um, but that's fascinating. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Dickstein. Uh, I don't see any other questions in the chat unless I missed anything. Um, and so I think we'll sort of um, 
end there. And, um, and we really appreciate your talk and um, appreciate everyone's attendance and participation. And we look forward to seeing people on uh, our uh, session in March. And uh, please remember to fill out your questionnaire um, so that you can uh, give us ideas for things you're interested in hearing about in future presentations. But thanks so much, everybody. Thanks so much. Have a great day and thanks for everybody's interest.